When the 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pro models were released in October last year, many described them as a return to form, with Apple bringing back several qualities absent from the previous generation, as well as introducing a handful of new features. I've been using the MacBook Pro as my main work computer every day for the last six months, and through such prolonged use, I've really been able to develop some longer term perspectives. Today I'm gonna to share my experience of using this laptop and establish how well I think it meets my needs as a full-time creative professional. Hey pals, welcome back. So just to clarify straight away, this is the 14 inch MacBook Pro with the upgraded 10 core M1 Pro chip. This version not only benefits from the extra two performance cores and one terabyte SSD, but also includes the 96 watt wall charger that allows for fast charging. I was really hoping that fast charging would be something I could speak highly about, but it's almost been overshadowed by the fact that I hardly need to charge this laptop at all. It's just so efficient. Unless I'm rendering large video files, which would be rare if I was on the go and without a power source, it seems to just run forever. I've measured over 12 hours of screen on time and I can confidently leave the house without a charger, knowing I'll have more than enough power to last me through a full day of general computing. The larger 16 inch version lasts even longer thanks to its 100 watt hour battery. Now, aside from the differences in battery capacity, the 14 and 16 inch models share pretty much exactly the same internal components and both can be configured with either the M1 Pro or M1 Max chip. So the choice really comes down to preferred form factor. I personally value the portability of a smaller machine. When I am working from home, my MacBook is pretty much always docked to an external monitor. So the 14 inch version just makes sense to me from a practical standpoint. So I'm a full-time creative professional and a lot of my work involves producing video content, creating visual assets in Photoshop or Lightroom, and general day-to-day -day admin. This video isn't meant to be a technical analysis of these machines, but hopefully sharing my experience can help give you an idea of the performance you can expect from these new chips. I edit my videos in Final Cut Pro, and my last MacBook would sound like a jet engine if I was working on longer projects or using multiple effects at once. When I upgraded my camera to be able to shoot 10-bit 4K footage, it actually wasn't able to handle these files, and I would have to revert to a proxy workflow, which personally I'm not a big fan of. The M1 Pro doesn't even blink at this, and is able to scrub through the timeline without any issues. I've managed to get the fans to spin up on a couple of occasions, but I was really pushing the limits for this, rendering a number of large video files simultaneously. The day-to-day -day work like sending emails or editing photos is pretty much silent. I've also had very few issues with compatibility, and all the third-party apps that I frequently use, like Adobe Creative Suite, are fully supported. I've been really happy with my version of the MacBook Pro. When it comes down to whether I think you should get the M1 Pro or M1 Max, I think unless you're working on high-end professional work, or you have a lump of cash burning a hole in your pocket, you're probably going to be fine with the M1 Pro. I would consider myself a power user, and I rely on my laptop for both client work and making these YouTube videos. And there's yet to be a time where I felt limited by the less powerful chip. I would recommend upgrading to the 10 core version of the M1 Pro, however, for the reasons mentioned at the start of this video. A quick glance of the Geekbench scores for these computers show that they top the charts compared to every single Mac released before them. Even the base spec M1 Pro with eight cores outperforms the most powerful version of the Mac Pro from a couple of years ago. That is wild. Obviously these scores don't reflect the full picture, but it's really impressive what Apple has managed to achieve through producing their own silicon. And I'm sure it's gonna accelerate competition in the market which mostly benefits us as consumers. It's a really exciting time for tech, and I'm sure we're gonna start seeing some crazy performance numbers in a couple of years. So I love the design of the latest MacBooks. In my first impressions video from last year, I noted that the chassis felt much more substantial than my previous MacBook, and I've quickly gotten used to the new size. They actually resemble more of a work machine, and I'm glad Apple seems to have bucked the trend of making smaller and slimmer devices, as we've seen with the new Mac Studio and latest iPhones. The design refresh also brings back some familiar ports, including MagSafe, Thunderbolt 4, a high-speed SD card slot, which, as someone who works with cameras, is such a useful addition. There's also a high impedance headphone port and a HDMI 2.0 port. More on that last one later. MagSafe is a funny one. I'd really gotten used to having one type of port for everything, and I was actually surprised to see it make a comeback. It doesn't really provide any benefits over charging via USB-C, other than a slightly safer magnetic release, and I think I probably would have preferred the extra Thunderbolt 4 port if I was given the choice. At the very least, I wish they would have matched the aluminum housing on the connector to the space gray of the MacBook. But what do you think? Are you glad to have it back? Let me know down in the comments because this is one of the changes I was genuinely a bit confused by. The design refresh also extends the MacBook Pro display, which slims down the size of the bezels, giving us an extra inch, which I'm sure agree is always appreciated. This has resulted in a notch design, which I'll admit I wasn't too keen on originally. However, I basically live in dark mode, so it's something I've barely noticed in everyday use. Apart from when using apps like Photoshop, which have a lot more tabs present in the menu bar. 
When it comes to the screen itself, I've been really impressed with the variable refresh rate capabilities, which Apple calls ProMotion. This is probably the feature I was most excited about after seeing it on the iPad Pro when it first came out. And in all fairness, it works really well. Everything definitely feels a lot smoother, and I'm really hoping that high frame rate displays continue to grow as a trend. The only thing I will say is there's a fair bit of ghosting apparent, as you can see in this frame of the Blurbusters UFO test. It seems to be worse when moving elements across the screen horizontally, and I notice this most on the desktop. Any file names that are visible look incredibly smeary when you're switching between windows. Right, back to the HDMI port. This part is a bit more technical, so bear with me here. HDMI 2.0 has a bandwidth of 18 gigabits per second, allowing a maximum output of 4K60. The latest specification of HDMI 2.1 has a much larger bandwidth of 48 gigabits per second, meaning it can achieve 8K60 or 4K120. This port is most commonly found on consumer TVs rather than monitors and hasn't really found its way into the mainstream yet. So along with many others, I never really thought that it'd be an issue. If you watched my last video, you'll know that I'm now using one of LG's new C2 TVs as a monitor, which uses HDMI 2.1 to achieve 4K120, putting me in a bit of a niche. There's no DisplayPort input like you find on most gaming monitors, and you can forget about a USB-C or Thunderbolt connection. But wait, you can just use a Thunderbolt to HDMI 2.1 cable, right? Well, that's what I thought. After all, Thunderbolt allows up to 40 gigabits per second, so surely this would be capable of transferring the data. I've done a fair bit of research into this, and everything I've read online suggests that macOS will only output a signal to HDMI 2.0 standards, regardless of the port used. It also won't matter if you try to use a Thunderbolt hub like this one from Cable Matters, so it seems this feature is indeed software locked, regardless of output. DisplayPort 1.4 has a bandwidth of 32.4 gigabits per second, and with display stream compression, otherwise known as DSC, you can output 4K120 on a Mac with virtually lossless compression. This got me wondering whether you could potentially output this signal via Thunderbolt and then convert it to HDMI 2.1 using an adapter. And no, you can't. So looks like we're stuck with 4K60 for the time being. I feel like this is a bit of an oversight from Apple and not a very future-proof decision. I'm hoping that this can be fixed, but I'm not holding my breath. If there are any changes, I'll be sure to make an update, so make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss out on future videos. The only other design change I wanted to highlight was the new keyboard. The touch bar is no more, and we have physical keys for the function buttons again. The keys are a bit more travel compared to the butterfly switches found in previous models, but overall, they're not bad, and I have gotten used to them pretty quickly. Now that there's no spec bump with the 16-inch version, and the internal components are almost identical, this 14-inch version represents a significant change in the product lineup. Before Apple started using a system-on-chip approach to both versions of the MacBook Pro, we had never seen this much performance from the smaller model, and it makes it a much more compelling choice for those looking for a portable workhorse. A lot of my day is spent traveling to shoots or client meetings, so for me, it's truly the perfect laptop. I've exclusively used Mac for the last eight years, and this is the first time I felt that the MacBook Pro completely meets my needs as a creative professional. So, I hope you enjoyed my take and got some value from this video. If you have a specific question, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, thanks for watching and see you next time.